How's it going, Rot? Everyone good? I'm glad to be here with you on this beautiful August Sunday morning. Man, I'm, I'm so stirred up right now. Let me just pray. Lord, I just thank you. God, you're so good. Thank you for this time that we have to be together. Just in hearing that um, poem that my sister Vanessa shared, just how she talked about how we belong and we belong to you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for that. And even as Aaron came forward and (laughs) he dropped the Davidic covenant on us, how beautiful was that? But I I just thank you, Lord Jesus, that that in that moment, um, that as you saw the heart of David and that he wanted to do something, Lord God, you said, you want to build me a house. Uh, but, but I'll take it up a notch. I'm actually going to build a house in you. And so, God, I just thank you that because of Jesus, you are in the business of building houses in us, that, Lord, you desire to dwell richly in us. And so as we uh, just share your word today, as we hear your word, uh, Lord Jesus, may you just dwell richly in us, God. May our hearts burn uh, as we as we hear your word preached, Lord God, God, we thank you for all you're doing today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, "Amen, amen." amen. amen. Ah, okay. So, Andy Minio uh, is an American Christian hip hop artist that has released about 14 albums since the early 2000s. Um, uh, in in 2019, he released this album called Work in Progress. Now, this album that he released was different than the other ones. It uh, contained a bunch of uh, tracks that were unreleased, uh, and it was his, uh, you know, his most uh, introspective album he had ever created. And in this album, he talked about his fear of aging. Uh, he talked about the celebration of marriage. Uh, in this album, he um, really opened up uh, vulnerably about his relationship with his dad and, and uh, on his, you know, most important day of his life on his wedding, how, you know, how a dynamic with his dad played out. And so uh, on and on. But then there's one song in the album um, that I absolutely love. And this song is called I Don't Need You. Uh, and in this song, he talks about his use of isolation and the pursuit of things in an effort to deal with his rejection. Um, and I just think that some of the things he says in this song uh, relates to what we're going to talk about today. I believe it's really relatable. So I just want to share some, can I share some lyrics of the song? Is that okay with you guys? Okay. So this is what he says uh, in the song. He says, so do me a favor. Don't do me no favors. I hate asking for help. My pride's too real. I would probably die starving before I asked for a meal. These walls I built, each brick a disappointment. Never told you how I really felt. This time I can't avoid it. I know I said I don't need you, and I know it's all see-through. But what else do you tell yourself when that many people leave you? I threw myself into working, trying to prove that I'm worth it. I've been holding my middle finger up so long my arm's hurting. But now I'm tired of all this trying. Say I'm good, say I'm fine. Ain't no time. Cut the pride, I'll just say it. I need you to listen. When I tell you how I really feel, don't dismiss it or start laughing or act like I'm overreacting. I need to know I'm not somebody that you just gotta put up with. I need to know that I don't suck if I never had no success. I need you to stop judging me for the things I'm into. And if you don't like it, then pretend to. I need you to talk to me gentle. I need you to reply when I text you. I need the reminder of my potential. I need your time for just a little. I need your word as instrumental. I need you to stop trying to humble me. I got a tough enough time loving me. I need to trust you won't come and leave and then pull the rug out from under me. I need a place where I can talk crazy, where everything in my life's hazy. I know I've been a little off lately, but look, man, it's how God made me. I need a minute. 
I need commitment. I need God. I need a vision. I need y'all. I need a visit. I need more than I would admit. And I always said, I don't need you. Always thought it was true. I don't need nobody. Dang. Maybe I do. Uh, well, it wasn't, wasn't me. It was Andy Menino, but I'll take it. You know, for many of us, uh, like Andy, family represents this place of deep pain. Uh, but what I want to say to you this morning is that God intends for it to be a door of hope. Amen. And so we are in the second week of a new series that Brandon kicked off last week. Brandon came, came in at the last second, fresh from, from vacation. So it was good to see you fly in here, brother. Appreciate you. Uh, so started this last week. If, if you only knew, is this series that we started. And in it, we wanted to talk about uh, hidden expressions of the gospel in our lives that are hiding in plain sight, right? And uh, these things have major implications if we truly understood how God intends to use them for good in our lives. And so today, we want to talk about the subject of family. Everyone say family. family. Uh, now, I just want to share my story briefly uh, real quick. But when I'm done, I am delighted to bring to the stage my friend and my sister, Tiffany Leffler. She's going to come forward and preach. Uh, and so uh, she absolutely owns this topic of family. And uh, so Tiffany, she is the founder of a nonprofit organization called The Alliance. Uh, and this is an organization that defends the cause of children and family. Uh, it also uh, connects them with resources and support to strengthen them and to empower them. Uh, she's also the, the co-leader of our adoptive community here at The Rock. Um, and so I am, I'm so excited to let her loose. So here's what I'm going to I'm going to set the grill up. I'm going to get the grill hot, but she's going to give you the meat, okay? So I just want to share, share my story. So many of you guys uh, have heard my story. I've shared parts of it uh, before, but, um, you know, I was, I was born out of wedlock. Um, um, I, I am the result of a fling. Uh, my mom and my dad, they, uh, they were not married. They didn't get married. And by the time that they realized that I was conceived that I was coming, the relationship was effectively over. And so I came into this world fatherless uh, and also with a mother who was really grappling with, you know, what it meant now to have all these changes in, in her life um, that were, were sprung on her. Again, her, she had this dream of having a family that was shattered. Uh, but then she also had these career aspirations of, of being a nurse and going to nursing school. Uh, and because of this newfound responsibility of a baby boy, uh, that was at risk as well. Um, but she did have to uh, support herself, and so she took the dive. She went to nursing school uh, anyway. And so most of my childhood, I was, I was always keenly aware that I was a little bit different from the other children. Uh, because even in this rundown, low-income apartment complex in San Francisco, uh, many of my friends and my cousins, you know, th they all had either both of their parents or they had one parent. While I was always being shuffled between my mom's house, my babysitter's house, my two aunts' house, my grandma's house, I was always being shuffled all in the same complex. And so as, uh, as I was starting to grow up more, my family uh, knew that they could not raise children in the area we were growing up in. Uh, and so we as a big group, my grandma, my aunts, my uncle, my cousins, all of us, we, we moved to Antelope, California in this big five-bedroom house. And it was literally Bel Air to me. That's why I love Fresh Prince of Bel Air so much. I literally felt like that was my life on, on, on screen. So we just came to a total suburbia. It was a completely uh, new place. But my mom didn't come with us. She got a job in nursing at the local hospital. And so she stayed in, in San Francisco. And so for me, uh, just as I continued to grow up and I was living in this house with my cousins who had their parents, I was doing my best just to be one of the other children, which didn't work out that well for me. And then I had friends I began to make in my neighborhood and at my school, and they all had their parents. And so as I began to get older and older, it was just more and more pronounced the pain that was in my heart for family. But in the midst of the ache in my heart for family, there was this place that represented hope for me. And that place was my grandma's bed. Um, early in my life, I had these stretches where I 
wouldn't have an appetite, wouldn't eat anything. But then I would go to my grandma's house and I would get on her bed and, and all of a sudden my appetite would be restored. And I would, I would eat, but I would only want to eat off of her plate. And I know it drew her, drew her, drove her crazy, but she would just let me eat all her food on her plate all the time. Uh, some of my most fondest memories as a child was when I would sit on my grandma's bed and I would watch Bible cartoons with her. I mean, this is so informative for me. I would just watch Bible cartoons and I would ask her all these questions about what was going on and she would explain the characters to me and would also explain the gospel implications to me. I'll never forget that. Um, her bed also represented this place of, uh, of safety for me in that uh, there was one, one time that I remember that I was unjustly and brutally abused by my uncle. Uh, so much so that I had welts all over my body and I uh, had to soak in the bathtub. And I got out of the bathtub and I went straight to bed. And in the, middle of my, in the middle of the night, my grandma woke me up at my bedside and she brought me to her bed. And she sat me on, on her bed and she called my mom so I could hear her voice and talk to her. See, my, my grandma's bed was a holy place. It was a holy place. It represented hope. It represented safety. It was this place where I was first introduced to Jesus. So family life for me, it, it embodied this tension of, of, uh, of hurt and hope. Uh, there was always this tension of, of lack and liberation. And what's interesting about that is as you open up the pages of scripture, you see that same tension exists in the Bible. That from the very beginning of the Bible, chapter one, chapter two, you see a wedding that obviously produces a marriage uh, that produces a family that becomes very dysfunctional very quickly. And because of the divine intervention of God, we get to the end of the Bible, which is our future, by the way. At the end of the Bible, you see a wedding that produces a family. Amen. And it's the redemptive purpose of God to do that. Amen which means that God has always been in the business of redeeming family, that God is still in the business of redeeming family. And at the end of time, when he makes all things new, part of making all things new means the full and finished work of redeeming family. Amen? And so while we're here in the, in the messy middle, you know, between, between Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelations 20 and 21, you know, God is still doing redemptive things. We are not without hope, right? Just like I had my grandma's bed, there are, there are places of respite for all of us as well. Um, and I can, you know, I, there, there's so much. I don't have time to talk about all the redemption in my life. You know, I have you know, a, a lot of people who are really important to me. Brandon, Leon, I mean, some of you guys know, literally met me when I had an Afro, right? Like, that's probably not that hard for you to imagine because I have a lot of hair still. But I didn't have a whole lot. And his family welcomed me into their home and they took me in like a son. Um, and it was, it was Brandon who taught me how to shave the first time. It was Brandon who taught me how to put a tie on the first time. I mean, this is redemptive stuff, guys. It was, it was Brandon's dad who got me looking all good and ready for my prom. Redemption. Listen, I, I am incredibly proud of my mother. I am incredible. She is my hero, right? Because today she has three adult children who are all healthy and whole and all serving Jesus. All right. I have a, yeah, I'm going to clap. Amen. Um, I, I would even say this about my dad. It, within the last 10 years, um, he and I have been reunited and he is an incredible man. Just turned 61 this past week, but incredible man. He is actually a writer and an author of Christian fiction he has five adult children who are amazing, uh, and he has put in tremendous work to repair our relationship, and he and I are committed to that. Amen? And so there's redemption, guys. There's redemption. So we got to get our hope up. Amen? And so last week, Brandon talked about how the gospel is freedom. Yeah? Well, here's a way that I want us to think about this practically as I wrap up. Okay? When you, the way you think about freedom is when you want to do the thing that you ought to do and that you are built to do then you are absolutely free. Amen? So you see, many of us uh, know what we ought to do, but we don't do it, or we do it, but we do it begrudgingly. But if you want real freedom, 
If you want ultimate freedom, it is when you desperately want to do and delight to do the thing you ought to do and the thing that you are built to do. And I just want to say this to you right here, right now, the sound of my voice, everyone who hears me, you and I are built to thrive in family. We are built for this. Amen. So with that being said, I just want to welcome up my sister. Can you guys just stand and give Tiffany a, a hand as she comes up? Good morning. Um, I'm one of those families that normally joins you online, so it's really nice to see the front side of all of your faces instead of the back side. Um, my family's been here at The Rock for five years, um, and I love this topic of family. I was so inspired last week about the hidden truths of the gospel because they're right in front of us. And and so when Sean called me a couple weeks ago and invited me to join him this morning, um, this was the first thing that what is right in front of each one of us um, that God wants to bring front of mind, but the enemy is trying desperately for, a, for him to either damage it or keep it from us at arm's distance. And so I feel like God's going to do some heavy work in us today as we are praying over this message. I even felt that heavy work that he was going to do in you, that it was all him, not my words, but his words, um, and just that he was going to do some work. Because I think we all can agree our deepest wounds come from here. This is our, our deepest longing. Um, we are born into a family, so we all have a birth family. We all have a current family. We all have a church family. We, we all have a family. It's part of who we are. And we're going to look this morning at God's design for family because he was very intentional from the very get-go of Scripture, like Sean mentioned. The, the Scriptures open, Genesis 1 and 2, with God saying he never existed outside of family. He was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the time when there was the earth was formless and he was hovering over the deep. He never existed on his own because he couldn't. He needed the Holy Spirit and Jesus in that Father, Son, Holy Spirit um, triangle, that trinity. And so he's saying, if I can't do that as a holy and perfect God, I would never intend for you to. I would never intend for you to live life isolated, separated, and apart from that, um, what you, that, that's the place that we have all of our needs fulfilled. God's designed for that. He also said the first commandment in all of scripture, do we do you remember that? Um, or actually the first thing he said that wasn't good before he gave the first commandment, he said it wasn't good for Adam to be alone. He created man and then he immediately said, oops, I messed up, I've, I've forgotten something. It's not good for him to be by himself and that's why he created Eve. And then his first commandment to the two of them was actually to have kids, to be fruitful and multiply. So, so just from Genesis 1 to 2, he's literally building the structure, the blueprints of his design for what we needed the most. And so in that, um, he needs us to need family because families actually fulfill some things in us that can't be fulfilled anywhere else. And so um, I love the word that Vanessa read this morning. She and I did not coordinate plans, um, but that word literally highlights these five deep soul needs that each one of us have because they are fulfilled in family. Um, that list includes to be loved, to have our identity fulfilled in family, the belonging that was mentioned at the end of the word. It also includes our deep freedom, which Brandon talked about last week. I was getting excited because I already knew that I was going to share with you this week when I was listening last week. And then purpose. And so if we unpack those things just briefly, we can see that love is to be loved unconditionally. That agape love that covers everything when you don't do your chores or you don't do your homework or you're having a really bad hair day. Like that, that exists, that love exists um, only in the form of family first um, because we have our worst days at home. We can keep a happy face on at work or at school. We can put things aside and say, okay, I can show up my best self to this meeting or this conversation or this phone call, but I'm going to come home and be the person that I feel inside. And that, when we love our family in their worst moments, in their worst days, oh man, that's that beautiful example of the love that God is giving us. And it's going to hopefully happen in that family unit first. 
our identity, right? Some of our identity comes from our parents. We literally have our mom's hair or our dad's eyes. But some of our giftings also are passed down generationally, especially the, the good stuff that we see in our parents. We recognize some of those traits in ourselves. We're supposed to have those gifts developed and instilled in us by our mom and our dad. And, and like Sean said, his grandma that felt safety he had in her bed, like that's part of his identity now because it was given to him in family. The belonging piece is huge. Belonging means being fully known and fully knowing somebody else. We all need our tribe, right? Um, we tend to see it um, in so many aspects of wanting to be a part of a team or wanting to be a part of the in crowd or wanting to just feel like you fit somewhere, but we're supposed to fit with our families first. When we have that, it instills in us this need to um, be more vulnerable. This desire to be known and to belong somewhere is just innate in the human heart. Next, our freedom means we can actually do whatever and say whatever and still be accepted. We have the freedom to make mistakes. We have the freedom to uh, try new things. Sometimes for little kids, it's just trying new foods. Um, for middle schoolers, it's trying new hobbies or new sports that they haven't tried or just going from class to class to class because they've been in one room with one teacher. But that freedom to be my full self, to bring my full self to every conversation, the freedom to um, just explore the world around me without fear of failure. We all need that. I think we still all need that. Um, and then that purpose. I'm here to serve other people. I'm not just here to be served. Babies are very um, needy. Like the, the whole world revolves around a baby for the first two years of life because they can't meet any of their own needs. Um, their, their purpose is to be delighted in. Um, and we still feel that too, but then as our families grow and as kids get older, their purposes are also to compromise and to learn to listen and do the things that other members of the family want to do. And so they're learning to serve they're learning to listen. They're learning to um, engage well um, in more adult activities where they're being invited to sit quietly or they're being invited to do something new that they haven't tried before. And so this ability to find purpose really does come from our families of origin. At least it should. Another beautiful thing that our families do, that God designed families to do, which again is kind of that hidden picture, is there's supposed to be a lens towards God. We have an invisible God. We have a God that we can encounter in worship, that we can feel deep in our hearts, that we know we, each one of us in this room has had experiences that say God is real, that God is, that God is tangible. But because the audible voice of God or, or seeing God is things that we have to stretch into that spiritual realm to do, um, he gives us tangible examples, things that are a lot easier to see and a lot easier to experience and a lot easier to show other people. And so this lens of God in a, in a perfect world with a perfect family, we'd be seeing God. We'd be seeing that unconditional love and the freedom and identity and belonging and purpose he gives. We'd also feel fully accepted and fully ourselves um, there's few words in the English language that invoke more emotion than the word home. It's a button on your phone. You can just hit home and it takes you there via GPS. But it's also a button in our hearts where we just have this deep longing for Eden. We have this deep longing for the world to be right again because it was our home. And so we have this beautiful lens of God saying, I'm going to show you what it looks like to be a part of my family. I'm going to show you what it looks like to be loved and to have your needs fulfilled and to know that you're delighted in. I want to show you how I feel about you because I'm going to set you in a family. So why doesn't that exist everywhere, right? <laughs> we see the brokenness. We feel the brokenness. Some of you might be feeling that um, deep hole of some of those needs of your heart not being met in your family of origin. And I have to pause for a moment because we have a very real enemy, right? So some of that hidden truth of the gospel is, is God's coming with the good news. The enemy would love to obscure it or delay it or tell us that it doesn't matter or, or tell us that it's out of our reach. And so we're going to talk for a moment literally about our enemy. Um, who of you are NFL football fans? 
Yes, yes. Okay. I became an NFL football fan because of my husband and because of Peyton Manning. <laughs> I love Peyton Manning. Um, I still I still do. Um, I, I watch less football now that he's retired, but I love Peyton Manning because I need a really good, good guy. He's very athletic. He's a great, I mean, he's a five-time MVP um, NFL player and an amazing quarterback. But what I also love about him, two things, he stayed out of the media, so he didn't do anything crazy in his career, and he was a student of the game. He watched so much game tape on every one of his opponents. He learned about every single player before his team recruited them to come play with him. He knew everything about the people on his team and the people on the opposite side of the field before every game. Like it's legendary, the amount of tape that he watched. And, and we know that about basketball players and football players, even soccer players, they're watching game tape, right? You become a better athlete when you know what you are up against. I would encourage you that we are better Christians. We are better believers. We're better sons and daughters and moms and dads when we know what we're up against. This is the enemy's attack plan. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay it out for you because God slowly and carefully revealed it to me that it's, it's pretty significant stuff and it's hiding in plain sight. And when I say some of these things, it's gonna resonate in you because you already knew it right beneath the surface. So a little background on our enemy. Uh, Lucifer was actually the pinnacle of God's creation. He was in God's family. He was the most beautiful of everything outside of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was like right there after that. It would be like being the firstborn golden child um, of God's family. And yet, he decided to reject his place in family. And I know that that's a hard place for those of us, if we are parents and we've had kids reject being in our family. He literally rejected his, his position in God's family, his ability to be loved and belong for both power and position. He said, I can do this on my own, or I can do it better, or I want to run my own show. He was the prodigal son, the very first one. So he rejected family first. And since he was cast out, since he lost connection with God because of his own choice and his own free will, he lost out on all five of those things instantly. He lost out on the love and the belonging and the purpose and all of the freedom. He now exists um, here with limitations and separated from God's presence. But he's been broken ever since then. He's been at war with God ever since then. Because coming from a place of security and safety and then having all of it removed is devastating. The first devastation is the fall of Satan. He's, uh, the verses that kind of back that up, um, I just want to read 1 Peter 5, 8. He's roaring like a lion, everyone. He's, it, the scripture says to be alert and of sober mind. We need to be aware of these hidden truths because our enemy is like a roaring lion searching for someone to devour. He is looking for his victims. He's looking to say, I'm going to take you out because I feel rejected. I mean, hurt people hurt people, right? The people that are deeply wounded can be the most difficult to love, the most difficult to be around, the most difficult to have in your family. Um, this is tough stuff because the enemy is seeking those areas of our deep wounding, looking to devour us, looking to just trip us up in our walk with God. It's also in John 10.10, 10, it says this, the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. He's not just looking to separate us from God. He's looking to bury us, to take away every semblance of a good God because he's trying to take away every semblance of good family. And that's tough. We see it in our neighborhoods. We feel it in our own homes. We see it in friends and family members. It's pretty much everywhere. And so Satan's goal is he feels separated from God, right? He is, and so he must feel it in a very intense way because he had the closeness and proximity to God, and now he has deep separation from God. So his goal is literally just to create that in everyone else. He, if he can separate you, I mean, we've all watched National Geographic. You know who the lion gets, right? <laughs> It's the babies, and it's the ones that are separated from the pack. If he can separate you from your pack, 
he has a way, way increased likelihood to take you out. So his entire attack plan is to isolate you and separate you from your family of origin and separate you from God's family, your church family. When that happens, and you can think of these people in your life who've been taken out, especially in the last two and a half years, man, they might not have had the supportive family that they needed in that time, or they just didn't buy into it. Maybe it was there. Maybe you were that family, and they just didn't fully accept that your love for them was indefinite, that it didn't matter what they chose. Maybe it was all the people who stopped going to church. This is a really big sifting in our culture today because it became easy to skip. It became easy to not attend uh, the enemy really, really, really wants to separate us so that we don't feel the love of God's family. The next thing is the enemy's uh, attack plan, his target has been kids and children from the beginning. That is, his, his, his eyes are set on babies, on those who are not defensible, um, and on the family unit. We see this as early as Genesis when they do the whole massacre in Egypt of all of the firstborn sons happens throughout the Old Testament where all of these different people groups in the promised land are sacrificing babies as part of their religious worship. As if a God would ask for a sacrifice of a, of an un, like a child who's completely um, just dependent on its parents, and then you're sacrificing that to a God. And then all the way through um, to Herod killing all the firstborn kids, trying to get to Jesus, to Revelation, where literally the enemy takes on the form of a dragon that's crouching in front of the woman giving birth. Throughout, from Genesis to Revelation, he's saying uh, his, his, his target is always kids and families. His target is those things that are supposed to show us a picture of him. Because if he can shatter your lens... He's not, that, that difficulty we're all going to face in our relationship with God is very real. We're distorted in what we see. We don't think people are going to meet our needs. We don't think people are trustworthy. We don't live in a place where we um, actually want to engage with our real selves. We don't show up and show our vulnerability. And so his goal is to separate us from God's family. His target is kids and families. And then we need to talk about some attack strategies. I'm a reader, and so for those of you who want to do a little deeper dive on the enemy's attack strategies, I highly recommend C.S. Lewis's book, The Screw Tape Letters. It's good. Like it's it's written from a little uh, a little demon writing to his mentor demon, and they're just talking about how they knock people off this path in their trajectory towards God. I'm just going to highlight three things to you today that we're seeing in our culture that we need to be aware of. That it's not just our culture. There's the world, the flesh, and the enemy. This is not just the world. The world adopted it because of the enemy. So the first one of those things is distraction. If we can go. This is our modern family, right? And this family might actually, you might even think they're having a really good family night because they are all sitting on the same exact couch in the same room at the same time. I read a, I read a study this morning by the University of Texas from 2017. So this is five years ago. But it said that you lose cognitive ability the instant your smartphone is within arm's reach, even if it's turned off. Cognitive ability, right? Like our ability to connect with other people comes from our ability to give them our focused attention. But we live in a very distracted world where the ping on my phone or the notification on my watch immediately takes me into work or it takes me into a friend conversation I was having earlier or it takes me into alert from my calendar. And yet the people in the room around you need your full attention so that they can be fully known. Oh man, I, Kurt Thompson is a renowned neuropsychologist. He, one of his quotes is my very favorite. It says, every child comes into the world looking for someone that's looking for them. i say it again. Every one of us, each one of us comes into the world looking for someone who's looking for us. And that's God. God has always got his eyes on us. He's always got us in his mind and his heart. He's the only one that could do that with all of us all at the same time. But we're looking for that from other human beings too because it tangibly gives us a picture of what God does for us. When we put down 
our phones, when we turn off the radio in the car with our kids, when we give someone our full attention, there is no greater gift. And you can recognize that, right? If you're talking with your spouse or a friend and you are the only person in the room. It's a beautiful moment, but society is saying we have to stay busy. Um, there was another study, it was very interesting, it was a marketing study that said 20 years ago you needed to hear uh, the same commercial on the radio or the same, see the same billboard seven times before you would remember that company. So like we'd all probably know you could call Bonnie Plumbing to get a plumber. We'd need to see the Bonnie Plumbing advertisement seven times and then I'd be like, I'll just call Bonnie. Like when my plumbing goes out. The, the new research shows that the distraction we experience, and you probably all feel this, right? Those thoughts where you're like, I walked into a room and I have no idea why I'm here. Or I forgot what I was doing. I was, I was making plans. I had three plans and now I can only remember one of them. Like we live in a distracted world. And so the new data says we need to hear the jingle or see the billboard 77 times to remember to call Bonnie. This is overwhelming to our relationships because it's overwhelming to our hearts and our minds. Like we live in this place and we don't see the enemy behind it. It's crazy, but he's doing this. If he can just make us distracted, we're not going to have those deeper conversations with our kids after school because we're thinking about what we're making for dinner. We're not going to have those conversations with our spouse because we're not in that place where we could be vulnerable because we're thinking at surface level. John Eldridge is an author of lots of Christian books, and he, he calls there to be three levels of our consciousness and our heart. And he says that Americans usually live in the shallows. The shallows are your everyday worries of, am I going to get every green light so I can make it to school on time? And, and what do I need to do as soon as I get to work? And am I going to be, you know, ready for this meeting or this appointment? The Midlands, he says, are the, the cares and concerns of the heart. And so we have those. How are my kids doing in school? And how are my relationships with my closest friends? Like those are the Midlands, but God lives in the depths. And if we can't get there because we're so distracted, the depths of our relationship with him and our relationship with ourselves, and we have to be fully with ourselves before we can be fully with someone else. So if we can't be fully with God or fully with ourselves, we can't be fully with anyone else. And so we need to get past this place of distraction. The next attack of the enemy is dysfunction. Oh man, every single show out there is all about dysfunctional families, right? If it's got a family, dad's missing or dad's an idiot. And then all of these families, like they're highlighting dysfunction because it makes us feel better. Because we think, oh, well, if I have dysfunction in my home, um, but it's normal on TV or it's normal in the movies, I'm going to feel a lot better about myself. And yet dysfunction is the enemy at work in a family because dysfunction means I need to push away because you're not safe right now. You're not verbally safe or physically safe. When we aren't verbally or physically safe in our families, we shut down, we build walls. Sean said it, we build it with bricks that say, I've got to protect my heart. I've got to keep other people at arm's distance. I don't want to be fully known because what if they don't fully accept me? They, they're not fully accepting each other. If we're hearing parents fight at home, if we're experiencing just tension, you walk in, the, we've all walked in those rooms and you're like, the tension could be cut with a knife. Those are hard spaces. We're not going to show up fully vulnerable in those spaces and fully ready to relate to others in that deep way. And the third thing is division. We're seeing a world that's full of divisiveness and divorce in our culture. The divorce rates have skyrocketed over the last few years, and this is devastating because God, what God designed, he didn't want man to separate. And so the division sometimes is in marriages. It's in friendships. It's in family relationships when you voted a different way. It's in the racial tension we experience. The division in our culture means if you disagree with me, you're dead to me. That's cancel culture, right? We live in that world. Like, if you don't think the way I think and don't vote the way I vote and don't eat what I like to eat and don't do the things I like to do and don't share my opinion on everything, then we can't be friends anymore. So we cut people off just because we have a difference of opinion. This is the enemy again at work because he is taking out those deep, intimate relationships over 
a candidate over over uh, uh, where you whether you wear masks because of COVID. Like there's little things that become big things in us that God said, I never wanted that to be a big thing. The world is so full of just this unrest and we need to fight. Like there's an injustice absolutely happening and that should stir our hearts up to fight. But we're not supposed to be fighting with each other. We're not supposed to be fighting flesh and blood. We're supposed to be fighting the powers and principalities of the enemy because he's behind this. And if he's behind it, we have the authority and the ability to fight it together. And to be fighting an enemy that we know is there, that again is lurking around, see, searching for someone to devour, but we know what we believe. And so I wanna, I wanna just shift gears now that we understand the enemy and his attack plan a little bit better. And actually we'll show one more slide. His attack plan has ripple effects throughout every other societal issue. The statistics are incredible. Like Sean said, I lead an organization that works with vulnerable youth. And the statistics on that next slide, um, the root cause of every societal issue that we face today is the brokenness of family. 90% of people who are homeless came from a broken home, 90%. 85% of kids in school with behavioral disorders who can't sit still or who can't function or who have ADHD or who have all these things, that can be coming from a brokenness or a, a lack of a, a dad in the home. I mean, it's unbelievable the physiological effects of interpersonal trauma. And so whether it's teen suicide or teen pregnancy, whether it's human trafficking victims, all the things you see on the nightly news, they're just not talking about those people having a family. Sometimes when we hear about like a mass shooting, they'll dive a little deeper and, oh, that person had a really dysfunctional dad or a really dysfunctional family. Not all the time, but often. But in all of these other societal issues, we're lacking what we need. And when we lack what we need, the results are devastating for our culture. And so our position, I just want to, I want to encourage you this morning that this is not the doom and gloom message. This is a, you have a family and you are created for more and you are created to be in deep relationship. First and foremost, because we all have an adoption story. That he's reaching each one of us in our hearts saying, you are mine. I chose you. I picked you. You were born into my family because I meant it that way. I designed it before the beginning of time. Um, I'm an adoptive mom, so are the Marlowe's who shared their testimony a few weeks ago. One of our favorite terms in our field is forever family. That when a kid is finalized in their adoption, they're said, now you are in your forever family. And yet all of us have that. Like we've all been offered that. Our families of origin might not have done a great job. They all lacked something, right? We're all human. Um, and, and yet God says, I'm placing you in a forever family that we have forever written for us. We're going to heaven, all of us, and we're gonna be in that beautiful family place together. Um, but he's written that adoption story in us. In Ephesians 1.5, it says, in love he predestined, meaning he pre-chose you for adoption to sonship, and sonship's really important, it's not just daughtership, um, through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Paul uses that word sonship very specifically because in Old Testament times, daughters had no rights. They didn't inherit land. They didn't inherit dad's job. They didn't inherit... Um, they would change names and change families and they would be grafted into a new family. When God um, adopted us to sonship, he said, I'm giving you all full rights. Full rights in my family, full rights in the kingdom of heaven because he said, I have a place for you. I've written your beautifully um, because you are adopted into sonship. He also says that, see what great love the father has lavished on us, that we are called his kids. And so those closest to God's heart, um, scripture through De Deuteronomy to Revelation, do you, does any of you remember? God doesn't play favorites with us. Like he's a really good parent. He loves all of us uniquely and individually, but he does say that there's a couple groups of people throughout scripture. And I would suggest to you even right now today that are very closest to his heart. Do you know those? Uh, orphans, widows, and foreigners. Yep. Those are the three people over in, all, all over scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. Those are the three people groups that are closest to God's heart because why? They are vulnerable. 
They're vulnerable because they're missing what? A family. You know this, right? It's hidden right in there. This is why he's saying, I'm going to seek and save those that are lost because they're not just lost, they're outside of a family structure that provides those needs. He's saying, I'm going after those. Can you join me? Can you go with me to those deep places and say, this little child or this former wife or this person from another country is without their family structure and I need you to fulfill that. I need you to bring them. And so our invitation um, is also threefold. Um, as we combat this, as we bring truth into dark places, into the world, we have three invitations from God. The first is to invest in your existing family. To invest that time to put away your cell phone, to set up family meals, to do rhythms together, to do life together. It's going to look different in your family than it will for mine. So I'm not giving you a prescription. I'm just saying that as we invest in our kids and our spouse and our parents that are you know aging, we invest in family. That's going to provide dividends into heaven. That's going to show them that they belong and that they matter. We need to invest so deeply there that we're undivided that we're giving focused attention to people in our immediate family because you're the best position to do that with the time that you have, with the proximity that you have, and with the knowledge of that other person that you have. Nobody else has those things but you for your family. The next thing we need to do is invest heavily in our church family because the world's a broken place. And churches are a family because, again, they point back towards God. They, they are the lens of what God's designed. And so when we attend, when we give back, when we invest in relationship, when we go around and meet and greet people on Sunday mornings, that's investing in a family that's going beyond DNA, um, that's going beyond um, just a, a knowledge of you to a depth of heart relationship. And then the third thing that God's called us to do, again, is to invest in, support, seek out, and encourage those without family. And I would, I would just strongly um, invite you to think of those people in your life. I am not recruiting you to be a foster parent. I'm asking you to think of, in, in modern day terms, Who's without family in your neighborhood? Who's without, who, what families on your kid's soccer team are going through divorce? Who are you seeing at work that just feels so isolated? They've shut down, they eat lunch by themselves every day, who, who just feels like they, the walls are thick in them. The walls are thick in them because they're not having those deep needs of their soul fulfilled. And that's probably because they've got a deep family wound. So who can you seek out and support that really, really desperately needs to understand that God's model of family was good? It's the enemy that ruined it. His model of family was perfect love, perfect attention, perfect attendance. Like he shows up for us every time. He doesn't miss those big things in our life. He's there for every milestone, even when parents weren't there for those big milestones in your life. And so I just want to, as we close, um, I want to invite Sean back up because we're going to pray for you. Um, I, I'd like to invite the prayer team up to the front and everybody to stand um, there's places in each of our lives that we have deep woundings because family wasn't what we thought it should be. And if your family wasn't what you needed or what you thought it should be, I just want you to know that you're right. The heartache that you felt when your family members weren't there for you, the heartache that you feel when you're rejected by one of your kids who's not ready to like allow you to fully love them. Um, the heartache you feel when there's dysfunction between you and your kids or you and your parents. That's very real. God really cares about that. Um, I was listening to a podcast the other day talking about our wounding with God and, and, and it actually equated wounding or distance from our Heavenly Father as you, have, you might have had an earthly father wound. That distance from Jesus might have been you actually had an earthly sibling wound. And distance or unbelief in the Holy Spirit was actually because you had a mother, a deep mother wound. It's very interesting that there's so many ramifications of family wounds in our life and the ripple effects of those are everywhere. They're all, they're all over each of our hearts because we live in such a broken place. And so I just wanna pray over you a blessing and then Sean's gonna pray as well. But I just want you to um, soak in that place that the, the design for family that you are meant for was really good. 
It was really healing and whole. It was restorative. Um, and God can give that back. It might not look exactly. He can't erase certain ways that the enemy stole and killed and destroyed, um, but he can restore. He is a redeemer and a restorer. And so God, I just pray over this church body. I thank you for a family. I thank you for church family, but um, even more so, I thank you for our biological families, our families of origin. God, I just pray over those places in our hearts that we just, we weren't pursued the way we needed to be. We weren't loved uh, unconditionally the way we wanted to be, the way we were designed to be. I pray specifically over those areas where um, people felt forgotten, where the the little parts of us, the childhood parts of us um, just didn't feel important enough or seen enough or heard enough or valued enough. God, the the areas and the times where we clearly remember not being delighted in. And God, I speak to those places and I call forth your restoration, your love, your belonging, your freedom, your purpose, your kindness, your goodness would flood into those places that we try to shut out because they're so painful that we're designed for more, we knew we needed more, and yet we didn't feel like we were enough to get it. And I just reject that lie in every heart, that it wasn't deserved. Because we're your kids, God. We can reach our arms up at any point and you will pick us up and you will brush us off and you will tell us that we're loved. And so God, I just speak specifically to those those hurt places in us, especially those hurt childhood places in us that are limiting us in our current relationships and our current marriages and our current parenting opportunities. God, that you are bringing a, a new perspective, one that we're not at fault, um, one that you are loving, that you are kind, that you are good, and you meant for us to have loving and kind family, loving and kind caregivers, God. Um, And so, God, I just pray a peace that transcends understanding would guard our hearts and our minds and that you would make us restorer um, of family, that you promise in Psalm 68 to set the lonely in families. That was your design for restoration. That things that are broken in relationship can only be healed in relationship, God. And so our relationship with you um, needs to be healed. And our relationship with our families need healing. And our relationship with um, our kids needs healing. God, we just pray over all of those things and ask for you to come and meet us here. The altars are open. Um, I want to make three calls real quick here and let me let me just tell you ahead of time everyone falls in one of these categories at least okay Um, the first call is to children in the room every single person in here is a child to someone Um, and you know maybe you're like me you were you were dealt a hand that you would have never wanted to see dealt to anyone else. But what I, when I, what I want to tell you is that the card game is rigged. That you truly were born and brought into this world looking for someone who's looking for you. And God is looking for you. One of the first things God settled in my heart when I gave my life to Jesus, the first thing as I walked forward It didn't happen until I started walking forward, let me tell you this. But as I walked forward, I literally heard the inward audible voice of God say to me, Sean, you've been looking for a father your whole life. I'm the one you're looking for. And so if you know that you are looking for someone, I want you to to know this, that someone's looking for you and he can be found here today. Second, I wanna talk to fathers. You know, there's an anointing on this house There's an anointing on this house to heal father wounds. That as Pastor Francis has pounded that in many of our heads, as far as the importance of of getting healed, listen, if you do not heal from those who hurt you, you will continue to bleed on those who didn't cut you. And so if you are a father today, 
and you know, number one, that you have to be healed from your own father wounds or you know you've dealt some out and you want to partner with God as he helps you to reconcile relationships. We want to partner with you on that. We do. Lastly, to our moms and our grandmas and our aunties in the room. I was telling Tiffany this this morning and this is, and this is emotional for me. Um, many of you guys know, um, you know, Tiffany uh, is the mother of a black son. Um, and so she has an anointing on her life to show up in this area. And, and let me tell you why. And this is not just for, for black sons, but I'm gonna tell you that because I am one. No voices are more important to us than women's voices. Do you know why? Our dads didn't show up. You know who did show up though? Grandma. Auntie Anta. Auntie Pookie. That's her name, Pookie. It was mom's voice who stayed. In Jesus Christ, when he was hanging on the cross, dying for you and me, in one of the greatest moves of love in all the world, the world has ever seen, you know what he did that was the most important thing? Is he stayed. He didn't have to stay on the cross, but he stayed. And so if you're a mom, if you're a grandma, if you're an auntie, you are needed. We need you. And so the altars are open. I just want to pray for you. But do not leave here. Do not harden your heart as you walk out. If you have issues in the area of family that need to be healed or resolved, we want to partner with you. Amen. With all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're here today and you would say, Sean, <clears throat> family has been a place of deep pain in my life. But I want to be healed today. I don't want to carry this anymore. Just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. I see you. I see you. I see you. Lord Jesus, I just present to you the people of God. Somehow, some way, we can be invited into this family, the family of God, and still carry wounds. I think a lot of us want to be loved so badly that we'll actually take being loved without being known. But God, the invitation today is an invitation to be both known and loved. And so God, I pray that first and foremost, you would come into our lives, come into our hearts. Lord, help us to know and sense your presence, to know you're real, to know that you're walking us through the difficulty of family but also, Lord, empower us to show up, to have the hard conversations, to sit down with the people who have maybe said things or done things and to talk to them about those things and to get reconciled. Because as a family of God, we will be together forever. We are forever family in this place. Amen. And so God, we just thank you for all that you're doing in our hearts, all that you're doing in our lives. We bless your name today, Lord. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Want to give Tiffany a hand? Guys, she's phenomenal.